Hello and welcome to today's Parklon discussion on Pakistan's foreign policy and economic challenges. It's my honor to moderate this important conversation with Ambassador Malia Lodi, who I will introduce in just a moment. Uh, but many of you, this may be your first Park Launch webinar, and I just want to quickly introduce Park Launch and its mission as well. Um, and it's an organization, and I've known Ali uh, since the early days. It was founded in April 2020, and really, in my view, is an example of what the Pakistani diaspora can do in terms of a real meaningful, positive impact uh, in Pakistan itself. Um, it's now grown, as I said, it started in April 2020, has grown into a community of over 300,000 people, uh, has members from startups, large global funds, distinguished professionals, both within and outside Pakistan. And they've hosted over the last two years four technology events uh, where directly they've helped raise almost 100 startups, uh, raise almost 80, over $80 million in funding just in the last two years alone. So really, when it comes to creating opportunity for the many and, and boosting Pakistan's technology ecosystem, Park Launch has had a real meaningful and positive impact. Uh, so that's just a bit about Park Launch as an organization. Um, I'll quickly introduce uh, Ambassador Lodi before jumping into a conversation. I'll try to have a moderated discussion with her uh, for the next 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll take some questions uh, from you. You can send them directly to Ali, uh, who can pass them over to me uh, as we go through this conversation. As I said, Ambassador Lodi needs no introduction, but I'll just flag that she served uh, for Pakistan in some of the most challenging periods of time in the country's history in the most important capitals of the world, including here in Washington, D.C., and at the United Nations. So this is an interesting and going to be an interesting and amazing and insightful conversation for all of us. The sense there's a lot going on within Pakistan. There's a lot going on in the global region and the global economy and geopolitics. So we'll try to get the sense uh, from her in terms of what's top of mind from her point of view. Uh, so with that, Ambassador Lodi, thank you for joining us today and for your time. And I'll kick off the introduction, uh, this conversation with just having you share with all of us uh, your point of view on what is going on in the region and the globe and how does it relate to Pakistan in terms of the top things that you monitor and keep an eye on. Well, thank you, Uzair. And of course, thank you to Ali who suggested this. Um, I'm grateful to uh, Park Launch and I'm happy that you told us so much about this amazing organization. I know uh, many members uh, of this organization. I haven't seen some uh, for a long time, but you remain in my thoughts, of course. Uh, having served in Washington, I did uh, come to know so many people, amazing people uh, from a very dynamic uh, diaspora, uh, and I'm really proud of them. Um, but here I am. Uh, now we will kick off. Uh, so I'll give you a sense of how I see uh, the global environment and the regional uh, environment. Uh, you know, let me start by saying that this is an exceedingly unsettled time uh, at the global level, uh, both because geopolitical rivalries and tensions uh, continue. And of course, the global economy uh, is also confronted with many challenges, not least because of the war uh, in Ukraine. But I think when we look at the overall situation, the overarching reality at the global level is uh, the confrontation between the United States and China. Now, of course, this has a direct bearing uh, on Pakistan because Pakistan has close relations uh, with both uh, global powers. Uh, at the same time, we're also seeing, seeing or continuing to see, I should say, power shifts uh, in the world, uh, but in an increasingly fragmented uh, international system where multilateralism, the whole notion of international cooperation uh, is confronting uh, so many challenges. It's being undermined uh, and it's being uh, challenged. At the same time, I think uh, if we look at the Middle East, uh, which is a critical area uh, for Pakistan, uh, again, we see geopolitical shifts, uh, the grand rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, which is helping to realign relations amongst regional states and actually transforming uh, the strategic landscape there. So in our own neighborhood, the challenges are, um, are severe. On the one hand, on our eastern flank, we have a hostile India uh, where Prime Minister Modi's government uh, is continuing to follow a policy uh, which is not creating the kind of environment that we need to resume a, a formal dialogue 
between Pakistan and India. Uh, this is for obvious reasons uh, in the wake of what his government did uh, three years ago in occupied Kashmir, where they illegally uh, occupied or annexed rather uh, occupied Jammu and Kashmir, bifurcated the state and made it a part of the Indian Union. And after that, the Indians have basically said, we're not going to talk about Kashmir at all. It's all over. So, you know, we confront that on the one hand, uh, and that's not the only issue. I mean, there are new irritants that have been also added uh, to long-standing disputes between Pakistan and India. And now if we look at the Western border uh, across uh, to Afghanistan, there too, uh, we are looking at challenges, uh, not least uh, because the Tariq Taliban in Pakistan, the TTP is continuing to be based there. And from there, it conducts attacks uh, across the border into Pakistan. Uh, and this is amongst Pakistan's top security concerns right now. So, you know, this is a very fraught environment, both uh, at the global level and at the regional level. Now, one can't say that this is just challenges. There are opportunities also. For example, uh, the Saudi-Iran rapprochement does open uh, opportunities for Pakistan uh, to push forward uh, on a number of economic, in a number of economic areas. So, you know, this is a very challenging uh, environment. And with that, I'll hand it back to Uzair. You can now proceed from there. Th thanks for that overview. And, and there are a couple of you know, follow-ups I have in specifically to two things you mentioned that directly then impact or uh, have a bearing on domestic politics and domestic economy in Pakistan. You mentioned the Gulf, uh, Saudi and Iran, but we also had reports that Saudis are considering normalization of ties with Israel. There are conversations going on in the back channels there. UAE has already done that. Um, and at the same time, both UAE and Saudi Arabia have signaled very strongly that they would like to invest in Pakistan, not just give handouts anymore, which then has led to the creation in part of the SIFC in Pakistan, where we've seen the formation of this council uh, with participation of the army chief, etc. How do you then see sort of the internal reaction to these changes, particularly in terms of the threat from the Western border, Afghanistan and TTP? And then domestically, the restructuring of economic policy making, primarily to attract Saudi and Emirati funding in. Uh, Uzair, that's a very good question. Uh, but I think in order for me to answer that question, uh, I would I would say that because we are seeing such fundamental changes all around us, uh, as I said, the challenges are growing, uh, but also the opportunities are there. Now, given this uh, backdrop, I think it's crucial. Uh, for uh, the government, whether it's this government or the next elected government, hopefully there will be elections at some point, to actually take a very broad review of the country's foreign policy. We haven't had uh, a wide ranging review of our foreign policy for as long as I can remember. Um, the last time I think we undertook something similar uh, to a broad review was under President Musharraf. So you can imagine uh, how long it's been. Now, a review doesn't mean that we change our foreign policy objectives, but a review does afford an opportunity to adjust policy to these changes around us, which are both political, strategic, and economic. And you know, the idea being to then use this review to reshape uh, our foreign policy uh, you know, strategy so that we can effectively promote our goals uh, much better than we do. So really, uh, a review means that you do not look at some of these relationships that I just mentioned uh, in silos, but you look at them in terms of their interconnections, because clearly, uh, for example, our relationship with China has implications for our uh, ties with the United States. Similarly, uh, the US policy of containing China has a, has a, has a, has a, has a bearing on us, and therefore uh, our relationship with the United States also has to be, in a way, we have to see how much of it, uh, it, it cannot be about uh, signing up to any anti-China coalition. So, you know, there are backward forward linkages uh, and implications and consequences. So it's a, extremely important to undertake a review. Uh, but unfortunately what happens is a new government comes in and it starts, uh, you know, foreign ministers typically start on these foreign tours and they often do so without any broad strategy. Now, because of there you asked me about, you know, investment uh, plans that Pakistan uh, or the previous government rolled out, I think you know the broad review that I'm talking about of foreign policy would also be an opportunity to align our foreign policy more closely 
with our economic needs uh, and our economic strategy, whatever that may be. So now coming to uh, you know your question about investment and uh, you know the Saudis and the UAE taking interest, I think we have to remember that uh, you know <laughs> to have an investment. First of all, I mean, I think your question is about the uh, the new body uh, that was set up under the new government, the Special Investment Facilitation Council. Uh, the idea of this council being, as far as I can tell, to fast track investment by these friendly GCC countries, Saudi Arabia and UAE in particular, uh, in our ailing state-owned enterprises and what is called um, untapped uh, sectors uh, of our economy. And you know, we heard announcements about the sale of public assets and state-owned businesses to these Gulf states, uh, the strategy being to earn dollars by privatizing uh, state assets. So, you know, a part of this uh, whole in, uh, initiative is actually repackaging uh, privatiz privatization uh, and trying to attract uh, foreign, uh, you know, buyers uh, of these uh, privatized uh, units. But I think, you know, for me, uh, you know, any new initiative is a good thing. At, at least somebody's done some thinking. But I do think it has to be uh, realistic. It cannot be a pie in the sky. Uh, because I, I do think that hopes of investment in new sectors um, cannot be delinked from the country's ongoing macroeconomic crisis. This is by no means over. Uh, and the unstable uh, economic environment. Now, Naturally, foreign investment from Gulf countries or other countries beyond the Gulf requires consistency and predictability of policy, as well as an atmosphere of political, political certainty uh, and stability. Uh, it needs a level playing field, transparency, and of course, reliability of judicial enforcement, uh, because all of these factors give confidence uh, to investors. So I, I don't want to go into, you know, what are the roots of Pakistan's uh, economic crisis right now? We can deal with that later. But as far as this initiative is concerned, I think it needs to come to terms uh, with the reality of the situation around us. Uh, and, and the fact that we, you know, I know we'll get into this question later. So as I said, I'll just flag it. Uh, you know, we don't have a date for the elections, uh, which means that political uncertainty will continue. Uh, not only that, we see legal and political contention over what the election commission has announced, which is that, you know, they're gonna undertake uh, delimitation of constituencies based on the new census before they can announce an election date. Now, this means that the earliest that elections can probably take place, and as I said, we don't have a date yet, uh, would be February or March next year. Now, up until then, I really don't see, uh, you know, investors sort of shy away when they feel that the situation is uh, transient, the caretaker government is, is of temporary duration, short duration, even if it lasts for six months, it's still six months, not six years. So unless there is an elected government with a fresh mandate uh, and popular legitimacy, uh, you know, only those uh, factors can contribute to creating the kind of investment friendly environment uh, that we would like to see in Pakistan. Uh, you know, you can't sort of just do this in silos that we've got all the things we're rolling out for investors to come in. Uh, but you kind of sidestep uh, some of the challenges, and as political uncertainty remains, remains a big challenge. I think your your point on uh, the review and then connecting that to the political cycle is extremely important. I think underappreciated in a lot of conversations, in the sense that if you are rolling all of these things out with a caretaker setup that is already controversial, let's be honest about that. With elections not on the horizon. The things that they will roll out do not have broad consensus among the political segments of society and by extension from the people of Pakistan. It's especially when you're looking at, you know, mining in Balochistan, et cetera, where there's a whole history of, you know, Baloch people feeling hard done by previous choices that have been made. So they would see it as a continuation of that trend. And then you create the risk of sort of saying, okay, you made decisions today, four months later, six months later, elections happen, there's disagreement on what decisions were made, and now you're in a pause sort of situation and everybody's sort of waiting and watching. So as an investor, you would just be like, okay, now what? And then everything stalls and you you exacerbate the challenge. And I think that's my fear with sort of 
the short circuiting of everything, you know, from a policy making perspective actually will electrocute you if you were to use that analogy, right? And and I think people underappreciate. So I'm glad you raised that point. And the, the follow-up to that specifically, Ambassador, is you've been in government, you sort of observe foreign policy, economic policy making within the halls of power in Pakistan. From a point of view of, okay, we have to have a review process. What are some indications you would like to see, let's say even in the next six months where there is a caretaker, as far as a conversation goes, that signals to you, okay, you know what, those that are even on the periphery of power right now are beginning to think in the right direction of a review process, a holistic consensus process, et cetera, that gives you some calm of saying, okay, we can sustain this direction because some investment has been made to reach an achievement. What would that look like from your point of view? Well, I think the most fundamental, uh, for me, the most fundamental prerequisite uh, is to unite the country. If the country is in the throes of a deep and intensifying polarization, um, and you know, almost every three days, uh, an issue emerges which leads to uh, political contention uh, and judicial, uh, in fact, uh, legal challenges as well. Uh, you know, I mean, that's the first indicator. Uh, I think the important, uh, you know, for for any kind of economic policy uh, to make headway, uh, the the environment that is required is one of, it's not an unsettled environment, it's a settled environment where there is a degree of uh, stability. I mean, okay, so you can't have 100% stability, but at least you don't have a situation where everyone's going for everyone uh, and you have the prospect of political turmoil. So I think the first indicator I would like to see is an effort at national consensus. And national consensus means national consensus. It doesn't mean cherry picking and saying, oh, we have an agreement amongst these five parties and that's good enough. No, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. Uh, you, we need to have an inclusive approach uh, to consensus building, both political and economic. And on the economic side, I think I would like to see other than the kind of stabilization measures that we will continue to need to take in order to keep the IMF standby program in place, and then, of course, to negotiate a longer term program, because remember, Uzair, you've written about this so many times, and so have I, uh, the standby uh, agreement or deal uh, is a very uh, short run, it's a, it's a very temporary reprieve. Uh, it's necessary, because it helped us avert uh, debt default. Uh, but that is not the end all and the be all of, uh, of economic policy. So on the economic front, what I would look at is, I mean, less rhetoric, please. I think that that doesn't impress me. Uh, you know, when our leaders say we need to do this, well, you know, you are in power, do it. Uh, don't tell us about what we need to do. I've often said Pakistan is the most overdiagnosed country in the world. We know exactly what's, what's the matter. We know what to do. It's just that we have ruling elites that fail to do it for whatever reason. We don't need to go into that right now. So again, coming back to indicators, I think, I would like to see and hear about uh, a, a, a homegrown plan of structural reforms that can chart a path to sustainable economic growth for our country. Uh, I mean, it's no good uh, celebrating an IMF agreement. I mean, we do that all the time, but what is there to celebrate? An IMF agreement, bailout agreement means that our economy is in dire trouble and it's in desperate straits. That's why we have the agreement with the IMF. So really, I'd like to see less celebration, or in fact, no celebration over <laughs> bailouts, whether it's from the IMF or it's from friendly countries, we also celebrate, you know, money is coming in from this uh, uh, Gulf uh, country and we kind of, you know, congratulate ourselves. I mean, not me, of course, and not you, Zer, but you know who I'm talking about. Uh, now, you know, unless we, we see and hear about this, this serious, credible plan to deal with structural problems that Pakistan's economic uh, economy has been mired in for decades, I, I certainly will not be convinced uh, that we are doing anything to get out of the trap that we are in. And what is this trap? Stagnant growth, low savings, low tax to a GDP ratio, uh, low or limited exports, and I can go, and of course, heavy uh, indebtedness. Now, this trap we have to get out of. And no amount of uh, you know, IMFs or Saudis or UAEs 
is going to do that for us. Only we can do it for us. That that's a very important point. In fact, I was you know earlier this year talking to some uh, Saudi interlocutors, and the interesting takeaway from that conversation was that all we're asking you to do is to do what we ourselves are doing. We're implementing good governance. We're widening our tax base. We're trying to empower women in our workforce. Um, so everything we are saying to you in Islamabad or in Rawalpindi is exactly the same. There's no duality here. We ourselves are leading in, in that direction. So we would love for you to join in on that. Ambassador, there's one other view on this in terms of the, the dependency on foreign inflows. Um, is that a lot of people, especially in the mainstream and social media, say, well, this is how compromises on important foreign policy choices will be made, right? The Saudis or the Emiratis will say, here's some money, and the allegation goes this, then Pakistan will have to accept Israel, and, and this is this is the quid pro quo. You've been in foreign policy, you know this is not as simple as that. And I would love for you to share some of that, you know, help clear that misconception that this is not, you know, how does foreign policy get made? And is it simply a matter of like, you know, here's 2 billion and here's a foreign policy choice you need to sign off on? Or is it a bit more complex than that when it comes to how even Pakistan, despite the economic troubles, despite strategic allies sort of expecting certain things to happen, does in fact make its own choices and, and guard its national interests? Yes, uh, absolutely, Ozer, you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, despite all the uh, speculation that has gone on for decades, actually, about what Pakistan compromised and how it compromised, actually, uh, Pakistan, through successive governments, military and civilian, uh, did a reasonably good job of protecting our national interests, uh, our strategic interests. Uh, of course, I mean, that doesn't mean that mistakes were not made. Uh, there were mistakes. Uh, I think uh, in our Afghan policy, uh, we made many mistakes. We were celebrating the return of the Taliban, for example, and then found we, meaning you know the people in power, obviously not me or you. Uh, and then we found that there's nothing to celebrate. In fact, we were getting into a very strained relationship with Kabul. So you know when you look at overall the making of foreign policy, uh, you know my you know critique, if you like, uh, even though as I said we've done well. Uh, you know, to guard our, our, our interests, our national interests. But I think my critique would be that we we sort of still seem to make and pursue foreign policy in a silo. Uh, if we have an economic problem, all our foreign policy actually should be to ensure that Pakistan does get onto a path of what, you know, you and I agree on, we all agree on, uh, of self-reliance and sustainable growth that we don't have to go from capital to capital in the Middle East, asking for uh, tranches so that we can have enough uh, foreign exchange reserves to tide us over for the next two months. That's not economic policy. That's firefighting and it's firefighting by elites, I have to say this, uh, that really uh, don't have the uh, public welfare in mind. Uh, they're doing this for themselves because you know to reform, uh, to have a reformist, uh, let's say ruling elite, uh, it also means that that elite will have to take pain itself. But at the moment, the pain is inflicted on the people of Pakistan. The pain is inflicted on um, salaried middle-class people, on the poor. Poverty levels have gone up uh, in recent years. You've written about it. I read you very closely. I'll have everyone know that I look at your tweets and I read you very closely. So if I keep quoting you, it's not because you're sitting in front of me, it's because you write so much. So I, I envy your... The fact that you're able to uh, write and tweet uh, on such important serious issues uh, so often because it's so important for our people to know uh, what the real score is. So foreign policy, yes, protected our interests, yes, but it needs to take into account uh, and be consistent and closely aligned uh, with our economic needs. Now, in order to do that, you first need an economic vision. Now, if our economic vision is just short term and it's about firefighting and it's just getting the next tranche so that you have enough money to repay your debt, then there's not much to align with foreign policy. But, you know, in a way, you know, I, I think you, we need to kind of think big. Uh, we are an extraordinary country. Uh, I don't believe in exceptionalism. So I'm not for a moment suggesting that we're an extraordinary country in terms of our resilience, uh, our ability to deal with crises at the popular level I'm talking about. Um, 
so, you know, we have been through difficult times and we've come out, I think, stronger, but we need to do much better. Uh, this is not good enough. And in order to do better, I think policy making has to be fundamentally different. As I said, we have to, you know, take account of the whole big picture, uh, not just uh, siloed sort of, you know. Uh, and then, yes, uh, you're absolutely right, Uzair. You suggest that at times foreign policy choices do have uh, implications in terms of how independent we can pursue uh, some of the things that we want to uh, pursue. Yes, it does have an impact. Uh, I mean, right now, uh, Pakistan is trying to navigate between the uh, US-China uh, standoff. Uh, it's not easy. Easier said than done, in fact. Uh, but it's what is clear is that a choice had to be made, and Pakistan made that choice. And that choice was that Pakistan's uh, security and economic needs were best met through its strategic relationship with China. So a choice was made. It has implications now for our uh, ties with the United States and we have to now deal with that. Uh, and that doesn't for, for, for a moment exclude a good relationship with the United States. But again, you know, it needs an imaginative leadership. Uh, I mean, I think what our policy has lacked, both economic and foreign policy, is imagination. I mean, I know some of the people who are listening to us have shown extraordinary imagination in startups, in doing some of the you know, cutting edge things that you and I just follow. Uh, and in a way we admire these greatly. Now, in the public sector, somehow this imagination sort of seems to disappear or dissipate. Um, perhaps it's the nature of the leadership we have. Maybe we need a different kind of leadership uh, that can think beyond today and beyond itself and can think of the country's larger interests and also take those painful decisions, take a hit politically. Because you know, if you do the right thing, you'll be remembered forever and never and never in the terms of your legacy. But nobody thinks of legacy. They only think of immediate power, uh, you know, whether they can secure power, whether they can continue to maintain power. If that is what governance is all about, then our governance is not going to improve. And lastly, I would say, because this is something that I was, wasn't able to say in your previous question, you know, Pakistan's economic crisis have all been rooted in governance crisis. Economic crisis is not separate from overall governance. If your governance is poor or weak, you can't have uh, effective economic policy. You have no means to implement it. Even if you have the best conceived uh, plans, you can't implement them because your governance is so poor. So I think, again, you know, we need to think holistically. We need to think, you know, in a, in a, in a you know, all of government approach uh, and all of people approach as well, uh, if we are to make progress. Otherwise, we'll remain where we are. Uh, there'll be extraordinary developments in the private sector, civil society. And I think that's, uh, that's a paradox I've talked about many times in the past, uh, which is that of a dynamic society, most of the time, <laughs> um, but a, a kind of a stagnant state. Uh, so, the, so this paradox between a weak state and a strong society somehow has to be aligned so that the strengths of our society are reflected uh, in the strengths of the state, uh, rather than the state being something apart and, and not effective enough. Look, uh, a state that cannot collect tax is the most fundamental, fundamental function of a riyasat or a state. But if you can't collect tax, there's something terribly wrong and you've got to correct it. And you can't correct it by slogans or vacuous rhetoric. And which is why I return to you know, the question that you asked, what indication am I looking for? I'm looking for serious policy beyond rhetoric and beyond uh, sloganary. I think one of the biggest myths, right, Ambassador, is that Pakistanis don't are tax thieves essentially and this nothing sets me off more than that in the sense that the average pakistani pays through the nose uh yeah. for taxes on electricity on petrol on telecoms on sales tax etc but it's the fact that the most rich pakistanis don't pay a fair share there are untaxed segments in agriculture and real estate etc which again i'm a bit of a strategy video game player and those of you on the call who've played those types of video games know that if you're running an empire or a state in those video games if you do poor governance and taxation begins to go down the game is over you're done you're going to be beat 
um, and and again, history teaches us, right? The emperor's most feared uh, or the yeah. empress's most feared people would be the military commander in the district and then the taxman. Uh, and if you refuse the orders of the taxman, the military commander was coming sooner rather than later to your fort to demand the, the tax that you owed them. Um, but for some reason, we can't think. And I think the imagination part is also important. For example, in the Punjab a few years ago, they said, if you make digital payments at restaurants, you get a lower threshold of taxes as opposed to cash. And then the consumer started demanding, right? Why are you not accepting digital payments? Well, why can't we be this imaginative in terms of digitizing land records and digitizing other transactions, et cetera? The infrastructure is there. We have one of the best identity systems and the small micropayments ecosystem through Rust. But it's, as you said, society's dynamic, people on this call, many technology people will fundamentally get it, but the state is unable to then sort of build on top of it and show that imagination on, on in terms of governance. Um, one more question, you talked about unity a few times. It brings me to my last question before I bring in the audience here. You, you know, elections does not seem like are happening at least until spring 2024. Unfortunate, in my view, unconstitutional. You cannot have an interim government rule a country, polarized country for so long. And then you have this sort of messaging by the caretakers minister, in my view, that they should not be doing in terms of we're going to take exports to 80 billion or whatever. It's not your job. Your job is to make sure elections happen. How do you see the formation of this caretaker setup and your overall outlook in terms of risks to overall stability in Pakistan, given where we know the playbook is going in terms of, you know, just today, President Alvi set off a constitutional firestorm. So sure. tell us a bit about how you're viewing political developments, and then I'll try to bring in the questions from the audience. Oh. Well, I agree with you, Ozer, uh, completely. I think the political and economic cost of delaying the election will be very high. Uh, the political cost, we know why, because it will further divide the country, polarization will deepen, there'll be political controversies. Um, you know, the economic cost will be high too, because what you will have is a prolonged period of uh, economic and political uncertainty. Uh, and no investor is going to rush in in this period because they'll want to know uh, what is going to be the next government? What is it going to look like? What kind of policies will it have? So I think, you know, it's one thing to delay it uh, till this uh, census uh, is reflected <clears throat> in uh, delimitation. Although I think to have an election on the old census is not going to be a big deal. Uh, you could still do that and then have the next one uh, on the new census. And the, and the previous, uh, the outgoing government had plenty of months because as you know, the census was completed months before this government stepped down. So if they really wanted to do it, uh, they could have done it and still have stuck to the constitutional obligation to hold an election within 90 days of the dissolution of the assembly. But I would say, okay, uh, you know, much as I would be reluctant to accept this, but okay, let's say the election, you can take it up to March, fine. But any delay beyond that will be very costly for the country. And I think it will trigger a huge crisis, uh, which will be political, constitutional, and in this environment, what kind of economic policy can be implemented? I don't think you can have any kind of uh, economic policy, uh, regardless of uh, the kind of people uh, who may be, may be in office. I also think that, uh, you know, when your recruiting ground is uh, 240 million people of Pakistan, well, so, you know, 60% of them are under the age of whatever, you know, very young, but let's see, this is your recruiting ground for a caretaker government. I think we could have done a little better. <laughs> I'll put it very mildly, but look at the vast talent that is available in our country. And we still go for people who, you know, uh, perhaps uh, who can be bettered by other professionals. Let's put it that way. I mean, you know, I'm not critiquing the people who are there. Uh, I'm just saying, but in any case, I mean, their responsibility is day-to-day -day management. It cannot go beyond that. Regardless of the law that was passed to empower them, uh, they, have, uh, they don't have a mandate uh, to follow, pursue, implement policies that, that is not their business to do. Uh, you have to manage the situation, sure, uh, both on the foreign policy front as well as on the economic front, sure, day-to-day, -day, but it's day-to-day. So they can't take new initiatives. 
that's that's the whole notion of a caretaker government. I mean, the whole notion, uh, the spirit at least, I mean, people keep citing the constitution saying, you know, there's nothing in the constitution to prohibit somebody who belongs to a political party. Well, I mean, that way you can find so many other things also. But the whole idea was that it should be neutral. Uh, let's face it, the prime minister comes from a political party. He, he's of course given up his membership, but he came from a political party that was part of the ruling alliance, which has just stepped down. So, you know, he may be a very honorable man, but then the impression you create is a lack of neutrality, lack of, uh, you know, the impression is of partisanship. And I think that doesn't help anybody, uh, certainly doesn't help the country. Um, yeah, I, I, I fully agree. And I would underscore your point on going beyond March and be a bit less diplomatic because you're an ambassador and I'm not. Um, is it will it will it will rip apart the federation at the seams if we go down that path. And already there are signals in terms of protests and how they're being handled, where we are beginning to see, at least from my point of view, this bubbling up of intense uh, anger that has the potential to really, in an, in a fraught economic environment, thirty plus percent inflation, et cetera, really have a impact that people cannot even imagine. It's unintended consequences of that choice. Uh, will be manifold uh, from my point of view. Let me bring in the audience. You mentioned Afghanistan. So Akhil Sajjad has a question about your view on Afghan policy. Right? It's an important topic in the sense that two years recently uh, went by since the Taliban took over Kabul. I've spoken to a few folks, including us and the army at USIP over here, and he's very concerned that you know, Afghanistan has once again become a safe haven of terror groups, a whole motley crew of terror groups in TTP being the largest. Um, and a lot of people ask, and Akhil asks, like, why did Pakistan choose to continue betting on the Taliban horse when to the researchers, at least it was evident that Afghan Taliban and the Pakistani Taliban are two sides of the same coin. Do you have a critique or a point of view on that, those choices that have been made? Azir, I'd, I'd rather sort of look at the choices we need to make now, given the situation. I think the past is the past. Uh, you know, we know what it is. We know why we did what we did. But today we're in a situation where I think we need to revisit and recraft and reconfigure our Afghan policy. And the reason is that whatever we've been doing in the last, let's say, two years plus, hasn't really yielded what we wanted. What did we want? We wanted a stable border with Afghanistan. We wanted an end to any cross-border uh, intrusions into uh, our country. Uh, we wanted terrorist groups for no longer be based uh, in Afghanistan. That's, you know, those were our strategic goals. Did we achieve any of them? No. If we didn't, then we need to change tack. We need to see how we can pursue these goals more effectively. And I think and I have argued uh, on and off uh, for a policy of tough love with the Afghan Taliban. Look, uh, a smooth relationship with Kabul is a st strategic compulsion for Pakistan. You know, we have contested borders. We have problems with the, you know, the other neighbor, the bigger neighbor on the other side. So, I mean, the last thing we would want to see is an unstable situation on this, on this front, on our Western frontier. Now, having said that, uh, you know, there is enough space between confrontation and appeasement. Uh, and I think just appeasing, uh, you know, which, whatever authorities are there in uh, Kabul uh, has not yielded what Pakistan wanted. Therefore, we need to see how best we can find this space between not picking a fight uh, with authorities that happen to be in power now in Kabul, but at the same time, ensuring that they do respond to our security concerns. Look, every country has, uh, you know, enough, uh, not enough, but some, uh, you know, degree of uh, freedom in using, uh, uh, you know, the toolkit that you have. Uh, the toolkit consists of many things. Uh, so we do have le leverage uh, with the, the uh, I mean, it's a landlocked country. Uh, they're dependent on us on everything that goes into Afghanistan, virtually everything, not everything, obviously. They have relationships with other country, with other neighbors as well. So I'm not saying that we should use trade, uh, you know, as a stick, but I do think that we need to think very carefully on how we can use some of this leverage 
to ensure that they respond, the Taliban respond to our security concerns, because these security concerns are very serious now. You know, uh, the kind of spike uh, that has occurred in attacks by TTP in Pakistan uh, and across Pakistan. It's not just one uh, area in the tribal belt. Beyond that, it's cities. So this is serious. We lose lives. Uh, we've lost more lives uh, than sometimes countries do in wars with other countries. So, you know, this is serious stuff. And therefore, it requires seriousness. But, you know, I don't see the caretaker government obviously can't do this. So again, you know, if, if this caretaker period is prolonged, you can imagine, again, uh, there's a cost to it. That means all of this gets postponed because they don't, won't have the authority or the mandate or the legitimacy to carry out. Uh, what I think they should do is to do this broad ranging review and then leave it to the next elected government to take decisions on the basis of that review. That they can do. Uh, but, you know, I don't know if they will because everybody is so fearful about doing anything new. I mean, there's, there's this strange fear. I mean, I've served in government and I come from the private sector. I used to find it, uh, you know, quite, uh, you know, well, not astonishing. I got quite used to it. But initially I found it really surprising. All these people used to be so fearful of doing anything. Hatke, if I could use that uh, in, in Urdu, you know, something off the beaten track was something they were very fearful about. Something would happen to them if they did that. So, you know, you carry on. Uh, the, as they say, the dead hand of you know previous policy, you just carry on with that because you're too afraid to change course. And I think this is where people from the private sector are so different. First of all, we are uh, outcome oriented, we're goal oriented. Uh, we're not looking towards our next sort of ACR, the annual confidential report to get a promotion. So, so you now some of us come in. We know we want you know we want to change things uh, because frankly. Uh, the bureaucracy, and you know, it's not just the Pakistani bureaucracy. It's the bureaucracies everywhere in the world. They're all change resistant and risk averse. Now, you know, you can't govern a country like Pakistan by being risk averse. So I leave it there because I see a lot of questions are popping up. Yeah, the, I think uh, on the bureaucracy point, uh, I don't know if you've seen the Netflix series, The Diplomat. Um, yes, but, I have. You know, yeah. So I was joking with some of my friends at the State Department. I was like, I wish you guys worked as fast as they show in the show. Um, exactly. And they were all laughing. I was like, sometimes I have to wait three weeks for a reply to an email from you guys. And the show shows you that you get things done in, in, in hours. Um, so that that's a, that's a very important point. It relates to another question that came in through the chat. There are a couple of questions on India, but I think your point on bureaucracy, I would want to insert this particular question first. What are the reasons for this? Like, why this, does this fear exist, given that you've served inside and looked at things from the outside as well? Um, are there any sort of things in particular that can be changed internally to make the bureaucracy a little less risk averse in that oh, sense? Absolutely. Uh, Uzair, I mean, I think this is the consequence partly of postponed reforms. Uh, we never adapted what we inherited from the colonial era into a modern governing mechanism that was responsive to a changing society. I mean, Pakistan is not Pakistan of 1947 or 57 or 67 or 77. <laughs> Yet the bureaucracy has roughly remained the same, roughly. The, the modes of recruitment, their training. I mean, I lecture regularly to civil servants, you know, at different levels uh, at their various colleges. Um, and, you know, first of all, I see uh, the quantitative de decline over a period uh, in the caliber of civil servants. The best and the brightest are mostly not going in to join the civil service in our country. And there's a reason for that. I come to the second reason. So the first is that you didn't do the reforms that were needed to make this into a modern governing force uh, and to deal with the complex challenges of today's governance. And the second is the politicization of the bureaucracy. I mean, successive governments, military and civilian, politicized the bureaucracy. And they only promoted people who applied, who did their bidding. So merit went out of the window. Discipline was affected, morale just plunged, and professionalism was affected. Now, given that, uh, you know, I'm not surprised that the best and the brightest don't join the civil service. Why should they, when they know that they, basic uh, sort of chances of progress is going to be dependent on political patrons uh, and pleasing uh, their political superiors uh, rather than on you know, their professional sort of merit. 
So I think, you know, we need to address that. And that's why I say, you know, Pakistan needs wide ranging holistic reform. Reform in one area is not gonna do it. So it needs a visionary leadership that says, okay, some of these reforms will not yield the results in the time that I'm in power. It will take maybe 10 years or eight or nine or whatever, but I want to start doing this. Nobody's done that as yet. I mean, the last person who tried to do this during a caretaker period was Muin Qureshi. Uh, three months he was there. He wasn't able to uh, do very much in terms of, you know, you can't do very much in three months. But what he did was he put forward a roadmap for good governance. Was it followed? You tell me, Uzair. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it wasn't. Go out of the window. <laughs> exactly. I think that's the other big issue, right, is that we always start from scratch um, exactly. after a change of government. People just have this tendency and when they come to power that the previous guys did everything wrong. There are some instances where I'm happy that they, that did not happen. So, for example, Benazir Income Support Program yeah. increased in funding by the Nawaz government. Then the Tariq kids have government rightfully so took it to a new level. The rebranding we can debate, but it was called SAS. They scaled it up, brought in Dr. Sanya Nishtar. So there are sort of like evidences there in terms of what you can do in continuity. It just doesn't happen often enough in my view. Um, and I think you would agree with that. Coming back to foreign policy, now looks, let's look at either a number of questions on India. Okay. Prime Minister Modi comes to uh, meet now then Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, doesn't go anywhere, things move forward. The Kashmir decision is made in India and things sort of go even lower. But then General Bajwa had a ceasefire uh, with India that has held up. Um, Prime Minister Khan to my organization, the Atlantic Council, did agree uh, and accept that there was something cooking in terms of normalization of ties. We had heard that famous incidents of opening trade, but then Prime Minister, as Commerce Minister said, it's okay. As Prime Minister, he said, no, it's not okay. And now we're going into an electoral cycle in both countries sooner rather than later um, in the next 18 months, let's say. What, how do you think about sort of the process of normalization? Because there are some, including myself, who would say, yes, Kashmir is important for Pakistan, but the benefits of trade or reopening trade might be you know, important. So we should consider reopening trade in the meantime and build on top of that. Um, others in the chat have indicated as well. So from your point of view as a diplomat, what sort of the, what what are you looking towards in terms of Pakistan-India ties and the prospects of trade and other things moving forward in the near term? I really don't see in the near term any chance of normalization between the two countries. I'm a great advocate of having a back channel that deals with tension management, the management of tensions between the two countries so that any flare up doesn't spiral out of control. So I, I really believe that we need to have such a mechanism. There isn't one. Uh, you know, when a crisis breaks out, it's all very ad hoc. Uh, so, you know, between two nuclear neighbors, if you leave things to chance, I think that's a very dangerous, uh, you know, it's, it's a dangerous um, strategy. But in the near term, you look, India goes to uh, general elections next year. Uh, we now also are looking at general elections next year. I don't think uh, until those general elections produce new governments, whether they're the same old or the new governments, I don't think you're going to see anything really happening on this front. Um, as for what should happen, naturally, you know, I would be, a, you know, I would advocate a resumption of the kind of broad based uh, dialogue that we had uh, with India. Uh, the dialogue, I think, reached a certain point during the Musharraf years, interestingly enough, paradoxically perhaps. Um, they did, and uh, Musharraf and um, um, Vajpayee, as you would recall, were on the verge of uh, at least uh, an interim interim deal on Kashmir. But that's all gone now. Uh, now we're looking at a government in Delhi which says they're not even interested in talking to us. <laughs> that's what they say. So you can't, uh, you know, it takes, uh, to use that cliche, it takes two to tango. We can't take unilateral steps. What we can do is to see if a back channel can produce at least some mechanism to manage tensions and then see if we can build from there. But it would have to be new governments in both countries that can take the process forward. And I think on trade also, we have to be, you know, uh, we can't um, look at trade uh, in a vacuum and, and, and divorced from what happened when trade was open between the two countries. India used non-tariff barriers to really squeeze Pakistan. 
And some of the biggest ad business advocates of trade with India, whom I know personally, a big businessman from Pakistan, from mostly from Lahore, uh, they were sort of weeping almost and saying, you know, we thought this would bring us, uh, you know, goodies. But look, our stuff is just lying uh, at the border, rotting away. Because they, uh, you know, so I think we need to also keep in mind that unless the trade situation, you have a level uh, playing field on the trade front. This is not going to work. Even if this political environment improves and everything becomes honky-dory, uh, India has a more, still has a much more restrictive trade regime than Pakistan does. Uh, and we are obviously a smaller country. Plus, I think you start trade not when you're weak. When your economy is in crisis, you start trade at that time uh, with a country that is hugely uh, more successful economically um, and has used non-tariff barriers in the past. Uh, you know, uh, so you know these are issues. I'm not saying that we should you know shy away from these issues. I'm just saying these issues should be on the table. Uh, we need to have a conversation uh, with Indian officials once the, you know this. Uh, let's say the dialogue begins. Uh, to to identify some of these issues and say, look, you've got to address these as well. And we'll address some of your concerns and you have to address some of our concerns because otherwise it won't move forward. Uh, it cannot be unilaterally determined. Uh, the relationship has to be on both sides. Yeah, I, and I, I think you're right on, on the money in terms of the electoral cycle right there. And again, my fear is that if on particularly on the Pakistani side, going back to what you were saying, your caretakers, your job is to hold elections don't get too creative with economic and foreign policy. I think we agree on that note as well. Um, last question to you, and it, it's again coming from the chat, because there's been a consistent theme in this conversation that you cannot divorce security, foreign and economic policy and look at them in silos. There has been a lot of conversation on the econ side, for example, among many of my friends agreeing, disagreeing on debt restructuring, default, does Pakistan go towards that? And the broad consensus among many is that the financial situation, regardless of outcomes, is still going to continue to, work, to sort of lean towards a potential debt restructuring if Pakistan does not get its domestic act together. In that event, assuming that Pakistan goes towards debt restructuring, you're the diplomat. How would you see China, Saudi Arabia, UAE as sort of the large creditors for Pakistan beyond the multilaterals reacting to or responding to such a situation where Pakistan just says, you know what, the Chinese own 30% of Pakistani external debt. We need restructuring. How do you think about foreign policy implications of that kind of event? Because I think, again, I asked this question, it's an important question from Reza, because it's an under appreciated nuanced conversation that has not happened in the mainstream. So I would love your thoughts as a diplomat on the implications on the relationship side of such a move. Well, Uzair, as you know, uh, since you work uh, closely on these issues, uh, the majority of over 50% of our external debt is owed to multilaterals. So that's a reality. And then, you know, you kind of slice the bilaterals and yes, uh, about 30% th is owed to China. But remember, uh, the, the, the Chinese generally uh, have not been enthusiastic about debt restructuring in general uh, at the global level. Uh, it, it's, it's a stance that they have taken uh, not on Pakistan, but on global issues uh, at the multilateral level. But practically speaking, they have always responded when Pakistan asked them to roll over. In fact, if they hadn't rolled over key payments that we had to make to them, we would have defaulted uh, way be well before um, the IMF uh, sort of, uh, you know, fire engine came in to put out the fire, <laughs> fire of, you know, potential default. Um, so I think, you know, there is space to do some thinking, but, and we do need it. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, I don't know if that's your position, but I, I think we will need some form of debt restructuring if we are ever to get out of this trap. But for us to have credible conversations with our bilateral sort of uh, uh, creditors and the multilaterals as well, if they can also, uh, you know, they, as you know, multilaterals never uh, get, they do increase the pay, repayment periods. That's a form of uh, debt restructuring. Uh, they don't, there's no debt forgiveness. There's no, none of that. There's no debt relief, but they do do that. They have done that. I, I served in Washington at a time when after 9-11, uh, 
you know, we did get that kind of a, you know, let's say fiscal space uh, uh, because of that. So, but again, you know, we return to what you started this question with, which is unless you have a credible government that is also, um, it, it's also implementing uh, reforms in the country, why should creditors turn around and accept uh, your, your, let's say, your request for debt restructuring? So for debt restructuring also, first of all, we will need very, very, you know, coolly to think and very professionally to think how best to do this. Because otherwise, you know, we'll continue to do what we're doing, which is, you know, keep borrowing more in order to repay old debt. We just can't get out of this trap. But to do that, we've got to fix our politics and we've got to fix our economics at home. This cannot be something that is, uh, you know, divorced from that or isolated from that. Nobody's going to, I mean, we have to have the credit, we have to build that credibility for others to respond to us. And to build that credibility requires a reformist government that carries out painful structural reform and shows the international community that we are truly serious about getting out of the situation that we've always been in, which is looking outside. Uh, we, you know, we look, we look to outsiders to solve our own problems. We've got to break from that. This is not what the people of Pakistan want, and it's certainly not what the people of Pakistan deserve. I, I think you're, I agree with you on debt restructuring, and I think to the point that you were making on bureaucracy, governance, etc. Uh, I spoke with the former central banker a few months ago. They were here for the IMF meetings, etc. Earlier this year. And I asked them the same question on debt, and they said something very interesting. They were like, let's assume everything goes forward, best case scenario. Let's make that assumption. The question they posed to me was, does Q-Block even have the capacity to run a debt restructuring process? <laughs> this is a very tactical thing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I was Absolutely. like, no, it, it doesn't, right? So I think when we talk about these things in, in terms of the broad 30,000 foot level, Best case scenario may look achievable, but then you go into the tactics, you're like, okay, does Q-Block have the ability to even hire the exactly. right consultants to run the process? Absolutely well, not. Was there, I can tell you, there was a time, I don't know now, I will have to check. There was a time when our finance ministry did not have a single economist, just generalist civil servants. I have nothing against them, but you know, finance and managing our economy has to be professionally done. It cannot be done by generalist uh, civil servants who served in interior uh, two months earlier, and then they'll go on to serve in, you know, tourism <laughs> three months later. Doesn't work that way. So, you know, my, my sort of final point to you on this area would be that unless we professionalize governance, professionalize decision-making, and make sure we have the expertise, we're not going to be able to uh, move forward I mean, governance will continue in this sort of lame, <laughs> lame way. Uh, and the delivery of, uh, uh, delivery of public services to the people on the basis of which people judge governments, that will always, I mean, there'll be a huge gap. I mean, you're not getting delivery of uh, public services. I mean, you have load shedding in the country. You have gas that is in short supply. You have roads that have not been re, uh, redone or rebuilt. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And yet, and yet, I mean, people like me, <clears throat> I mean, I pay tax the moment I leave my house because I've paid my, for my car, <laughs> toll tax. I've paid, you know, I've done all of that. And what do I get in return? So, I mean, I'm only talking about myself personally. I, you know, I still belong to a privileged uh, class of people. Imagine the poor person who is confronted with the most pernicious tax, which is inflation. Imagine that person. And he looks around and his, uh, you know, the garbage has been, hasn't been collected in his neighborhood because the local uh, government is so inefficient and corrupt. I mean, what do you expect then? So, you know, even to create a tax culture, we have to keep some of these things in mind. People will only pay tax if they feel they're getting something in return. But then the fat cats who don't pay tax, but they take away all our resources so many, in so many ways. So I agree, you got to tax agriculture, you've got to uh, tax the service sector, uh, uh, urban uh, property, absolutely 100%. I mean, these big property tycoons have been making zillions. Uh, I'd like to see their tax records. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And the gross figure according to the UNDP is 17 and a half billion a year, given as dole outs. 
the loss and damages of the floods last year, the catastrophic floods were 30 billion. So two years worth of handouts uh, to the elite in Pakistan would make up for all of the one third of the country that was underwater. I just want to leave people with that figure. But in terms Uzair, of one, one thing I would say, because I don't want people to think that I'm down on Pakistan. I'm not. I was going to ask that question as a yeah, concluding I think, part. I think, you know, I'm not down on Pakistan. I think there is much that is happening in Pakistan, which is a source of optimism and hope for our country. It's the governance that we have a problem with. Uh, it's the state sector which is the problem. Uh, the rest of the country somehow is able to manage and show extraordinary uh, enterprise, actually, in doing things right. Um, and I think the amount, uh, the way in which uh, the private sector has made up for the slack in the, in the state sector, uh, I mean, the largest uh, fleet of ambulances are run by the pri by private people. <laughs> uh, education. I mean, look at the gap. Again, you know, uh, there are so many NGOs that are doing fantastic work. So, you know, we should take pride in this also. And also, I think it tells us that we can do it. Uh, we have the capacity. We have the talent. We have the imagination. We have the intelligence. And we can compete uh, internationally as well. If only the government or governance can be put right. So I'll end on that note. <laughs> no, I, I think it, you've hit the nail on the head. In fact, again, I'll go back to my introduction of park launch, right? In the last two years, the most difficult period of economic times in Pakistan, if a group like that can help 80 startups raise $80 million, Amazing. imagine if we had good governance, how much more money can be capitalized uh, in the country to promote entrepreneurship, right? And that's the engine of growth. That's the engine of dynamism. So I'm with you. I'm not a down. Uh, I think there's a lot of latent potential here that can be unleashed. Governance and politics is a channel, a challenge. And I think you and I both agree that the constitution says hold elections and elections must be held sooner rather than later. And the longer this is prolonged, the more damage will happen to the federation. So on that note, I think hopefully people will pay attention to that. Thank you for taking our time on a Sunday. Thank you to a lot of people who joined on a Sunday morning, uh, Pacific time evening in Pakistan. Um, and and please stay in touch and, and we'll be hosting more webinars through Parkland. So Khudafis. Thank you, Zair. Bye.